Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, Luke chapter 17. We're building off of what took place uh, last week with the days of Noah. And this time we're going into the, into the days of Lot. And it says now starting at uh, chapter 17. Let's start at verse 22 just for re to rehearse what also was said last week. Then he said to the disciples, meaning Jesus talking to his disciples that are about him, said, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the sons of man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here and look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes of one part from heaven shines to the other part unto heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will, also, uh, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married. They married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. That's a powerful word. Destroyed them all. Except Noah and his family who believed God. Brought into the ark of safety. Christ, the refuge for all humanity to come into Christ Jesus. Because destruction is coming. In this, it's been made fun of over the years, and people make fun of it in a variety of ways, and you have comedy shows today, and all kinds of jokes are made, and uh, oh, it's the ends of the day, oh, a doomsayer, and all kinds of things are made to make a mockery of the very truthfulness of it that it's coming. It truly is coming. Destruction upon all that, it, that we know, that we see, it is all going to be swept aside. St. Augustine, when he saw the collapse of Rome starting to approach, and and, uh, but even in all this, people would say, you know, Rome's been here for so long, the Roman Empire. How could it possibly fall? We're Rome. And St. Augustine said that if heaven and earth will pass away, then so will Rome as well. Coming to the understanding that all things are going to come to an end. And Jesus himself said, like the days of Noah, they did this, they did that, but destruction came. Even though we don't acknowledge it, even though we defy it, even though we reject it, even though we say, oh, no, it can't be, it's not going to be that way, doesn't alter the truthfulness of it that it's coming. You can ignore it. You can try to avoid it. You can delay it and just say, well, I'm not going to pay attention to it. I'm amazed how many times we can approach things with an ostrich-type philosophy, where if we stick our head in the sand, we feel it's just going to go away. And if you notice, it doesn't work that way. That eventually, eventually, time unfolds and Christ has his way. But in this, and as of last week, it was about Noah, but Jesus gave another scenario. And he said, likewise, in verse 28. Likewise, meaning it happened again in a different way, but it happened again. And another example was set in history for every person to recognize and know. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, and they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Within just a couple verses, says the same thing. Do you think that maybe that Christ is trying to convey something to us? Destroyed them all. That means all means what? Everything, everyone, everything that was there. Yep, moms, dads. Babies, children, cattle, oxen, you name it, if it had breath, dead. That's the seriousness of knowing Christ. That's the weight that God Almighty puts on knowing and being in the will of God. Destroyed them all. Don't we not know and have we not heard that no flesh shall glory in the presence of God? What we hold as noble and honorable, he looks at and says, I want no part of it. The flesh nature and all the things of this world, we look at and say, so valuable, so wonderful, so noble, so honorable, and a variety of things and heroes are made out of, but even in this, that if we do not have the love of God, what's the Bible say in Corinthians? You're nothing, nothing. 
God Almighty is sending us a message and has sent this message that destroyed them all. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Meaning, life is normal. Business as usual. Things went on as they always have gone on. Generation to generation. It sometimes can get to the point of normality that we grow older and we see things, well, that's just the way it is. Do we not know that even that we grow older is a signifying that there's a problem in our creation? The very fact that we grow older and decrepit and fall into a state of collapse, have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, have a hard time even shuffling our feet here and there without, without tripping or having to watch things and see the wrinkles taking place and the gray hair coming and, and the sicknesses and pains and aches are all signs that there's something wrong. It's not the way it's supposed to be that sin is in the world. And it's devouring and decaying everything around us. But here's the good news. There's an escape. There's a way out. As there was a way out for Noah, as there was a way out for Lot. Simply what? Obey God's word. Lot listened to the word that came forth and followed and did in accordance with what they said. And in this found salvation, not destruction. And Jesus is saying, likewise, in those same days that they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. The buying and the selling of things, they did that. Imagine the person who's planning, gee, I could buy that field and plant and, and could work on this and work on that and I'll build a new barn and maybe we could store it here and Mad families getting together and planning what they're going to do on a vacation, travel. You know, we could, we're in Sodom here. You know, we've never visited up north. Why don't we go up to Galilee and see the Sea of Galilee and hire a rowboat and go out for a ride. And they could have all kinds of plans. They could go down into Egypt. You know, the, the wonders and the of beauty of Egypt. And, you know, we could take down and sell our wares and we could make our baskets and our quilts and go on down there and sell our wares down in Egypt and Everybody buying and selling and planting and building and working and, and uh, get, sitting down and making business transactions being made. People opened their shops that morning, opened up and here I am ready for business. People planning on coming and I'll, I'll put your new sore in and maybe we could build you a new bucket and, uh, and I could build a new ceramic thing for you. And people were planning war and, and uh, there were fights taking place in people's lives. Families were still feuding. You know that happens. It's not just our age. It's humanity. Because there's a problem. Picture now that everything that's going on today in our world, the feuding, the fighting, the difficulties, the politics, the kings rise, the kings fall, kings fighting one another, people belong to the army, young kids trying to plan and dream what they're going to do with their life. There was a life still filled with decadence, as we know with Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a life filled with decadence. But still, they worked, they shopped, they planted, they built, they, did, they drew water in the morning, they planted their crops, they took care of the cattle, they raised their kids. And they did all things according to their own way and their own will, according to the commands of the king that was king of Sodom. It's, we know from Genesis that at this time, in the days of Sodom, that it were fertile fields. It says that the area of Sodom and Gomorrah were lush fields like the gardens of Eden. Lush fields like the Garden of Eden, bringing forth wonderful fruit. As a matter of fact, when Abraham and Lot were growing so large with the blessings of God that it was time for them to separate, in this, Abraham said, Lot, Choose wherever you want to go. If you go north, I'll go south. If you go west, I'll go east. We'll separate. Wherever you go, I'll go the other way. And Lot lifted his eyes and he saw the area of Sodom and Gomorrah and he saw how beautiful it was and how fertile and he chose that land. That's how wonderful it was, how beautiful it was, how, how lush that it was. And he chose with his eyes. He saw, he chose it, he took it, he went there. Picture this now taking place. 
All the troubles and the trials that are going on in this world, all the buying, the selling, stocks open on Monday morning, bang, people are buying, selling, clicking that computer all day, click, 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 trying to get that extra point, trying to do this, trying to make an extra buck, trying to plan, buying land, going to do this. And you know, in all this, trans I have daily business. Families coming together, mom cooking a meal, dad cooking in the microwave. Kids being raised. But we also know that in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, a deep wickedness was rooted in there. A deep wickedness. A perversion. A weakness in a, of immoral conduct. Decadence. Was saturated into the ranks that even the, even the men taught their sons. The, the men taught the children to live in a way that was contrary to the things of God. A decadence. A decaying of morality had so permeated and so saturated and so well rooted in their lives that it became a family affair, it became a town affair, that even when the angels of destruction came into Sodom, the city of Sodom, the whole town of men and young boys came together and wanted to do that which is contrary to God. And even when struck with blindness, still continued to seek and to do that which is evil. In this, they bought, they sold that day, they planted, they built, but at nighttime when the sun fell, that's where they were. They still had family traditions. There were still moms and dads planning, people separating and, and promiscuity and a variety of ways and, and animals and raising animals and buying and selling. We need to remember that it was life as life goes, giving no thought to what they were doing and giving no consideration Sometimes people give thought to it, but no weight on the thoughts. Giving no weight, no consideration to the times and what's going on. As though there is no holy God that is watching over the things of the earth. As though there is no holy, loving, separated, almighty, powerful God who formed all things. Living life as though that is not in existence, as though he doesn't care, as though he has held his peace and he cares not for what you're doing. When actually, I guess for the lack of better words, he's biding his time. He's waiting for the times to unfold when he says, now's the day. And when that day happens, it's not going to be, by the way, today's the day. It's not going to be, better get it straight, for tomorrow we die. See, man says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They know they're going to die, so they just live their life. Isaiah the prophet said, they eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The philosophy of man is, get yours now, enjoy your life today, because you're going to die anyway. As a matter of fact, we tell each other and laugh that there are two things you can count on in this life. Death and taxes. And we make jokes of it and realize that death and taxes, everybody knows. We call it the golden years. As we get all hunched over and weak and frail, and you're in your golden years. What's that mean? You're about to die. And that's what's going on. No one dies, they pass away. You have little nurses coming in now and do their holistic thing. And, over the bed. What are you doing? Helping them pass. Deceived. Devils at work. As though they have the energy to fix a fly. Deceived. Rather than realizing that there's a God in heaven who sees all things. And people today in a variety of different countries and a variety of different families and family endeavors are living their lives as though, well, I'm just going to enjoy my life and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to get this and I'm going to buy that toy and I'm going to get this and have this and I'm going to take a travel and without giving thought to all the decadence that's really going on in the world. Do we realize what's going on today in Bangladesh? Do we realize what's going on in the urban streets of our cities today? Do we know what's going on in the back rooms of our own Pittsfield homes and Epsom homes and trailer parks? And do we know what's going on in all these different places and what's going on with the, on the streets and the selling of drugs and what people are doing to get those drugs? And are, we seeing, are we really reading the news and seeing 
people picking up the baseball bats and whacking some guy off the head because they're trying to pick up some extra bucks or just to have, call it fun. When you start seeing and realize what's going on, that we call them health clinics as young girls go in and have something torn aside inside them. And we just, well, it's life is normal. Just, it's life. I wish it wasn't that way, but that's the way it is. You know how it is. And we just look past it. Not realizing really what's going on. Young girls being sold, set up in brothels. We just look at it and say, well, you know, as long as I'm having a good day. Do we not know there's a God in heaven watching over these things today? And that Jesus said that likewise, as in the days of Lot, so are we not experiencing and expressing in our world still the days of Lot? And says, as it was in the days of Lot, that they just bought, they sold, they planted. They're just doing business as normal. Just living their life without giving full consideration to the heavy weight of judgment that is on the horizon. And that's exactly what it is. The heavy weight of imminent destruction, judgment of God, doomsday, the hand of God, the fullness of God's revelation about to be known, where wickedness will flee, where wickedness will try to... Jesus even said that they'll be crying out for the mountains to cover them and there'll be no place for them to hide. Just as they hid in the days of Adam and Eve in the garden and God Almighty cries out, where are you? He's not going to be crying out this time, where are you? He's going to be knowing exactly where you and I are. People today giving themselves husbands, giving themselves over to that which is not profitable in their own homes. Sneaking away off into this and to that and trying to lead their lives in such a way as though they're getting away with something without realizing that there's a God in heaven who knows exactly where you're at and is wooing you and calling you today. He's not going to say an hour before, oh, by the way, this is the time. I'm coming, so you better straighten up. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. And you know, I didn't mean it. I just got swept away. It's the devils. He's going to say, no, it's you. It's you. It's me. It's them. It's a, it's a point our own figure out ourselves. Because we have a tendency sometimes, as the old Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. When in actuality... It's your submission. And God's calling for us to be holy and a holy people. And why, does, why don't I go and preach that instead to, to the people in the world? He told his disciples. He told his disciples. Because you know judgment starts right in the house of God. Every Christian you know, every believer you know, isn't that what God has to do in this church, our church, in us? Start with me, Lord that this church and every person who comes in needs to recognize and understand the, the seriousness of God Almighty's presence, God Almighty's coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can look at it and say, well, it's probably not going to happen in my day. The day you die, that's just as good as the day of the Son of God coming into your life. For we die once and then the judgment. We can look at all the things that we give ourselves to, and this is what I have found, that we give ourselves to that which we love. And whatever we love, is that's what we give ourselves to. Whatever we love, that's what we give ourselves to. And we can look at it and pat ourselves on the back in the sense that, well, it's family, it's family tradition, it's family value. But you'd better be looking at it instead as that is God in this for me. Is my mind on the things of God? Is my heart right with God? Jesus was, came into Capernaum. Jesus the Christ came and did a mighty work in Capernaum. People were healed. Devils were cast out. Blind eyes were open. He taught and he preached the word of God. Here, mighty works were done in Capernaum. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. Matter of fact, that's not too far away. Why don't we turn there? Matthew chapter 11. Matthew, chapter 11, 23 and 24. Jesus turned to the city of Capernaum. And you, Capernaum, you are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Jesus came to Capernaum and did all of these works. 
and they wanted all of the wonders that God would do for them. Heal me. Provide for me. Feed me. Take care of me. Heal my son. Heal my daughter. Give me food to eat, fish, bread. Give to me. They loved the entertainment of all seeing. Crowds would follow him to see all the things that he would do. He says that he healed everyone who came his way. But he turns to Capernaum and says, if the works, he says, woe to you. If the works that were done to you were done in Sodom, they would have repented, would have remained till to this day. But you are refusing to repent and follow after me. And he says, woe to them. That's why we sang that song. We don't want just blessings. We want you. Because to have God is to have everything else. We can get caught up in just having this value system in our mind that's actually deceiving us from the presence of God, the power of God, the presence of God in our lives. And now here it is, if he says, woe to Capernaum for the works that were done in you, how much worse would it be for those who the Holy Spirit's been poured out into your life? Think of it. If he says, woe to you, Capernaum, for the works that were done in you were done in Sodom, they'd be to this day. How much for us today who have received the Holy Spirit, have, been, have the Holy Spirit poured out into our lives, have a sense that God is in our lives, and turn away from it. We think he's just going to be, oh, well, that's, you know, I know it's difficult. No way. He turned to his own city, Capernaum, in an area and landed. He, was, he knew well his own brethren, Israelites, Jews. And he turns to him and says, whoa. Then the same woe was to me. And the same woe is to you. The seriousness of it. That's why I do fear and have a great fear for anyone who turns away from the things of God. Because you know that God is not going to just look at it and say, oh, gee, I feel bad for him. But instead, he's wooing and he's calling, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from your wicked ways. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Get right with God. Do we not know that the destruction is imminent? And anyone who passes away, anyone who takes that last breath and passes into eternity, the Son of Man's days are as good as good for you, even though they haven't yet come fully. If you die, that's as good as happening anyway. There is no second chance in that regard. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17 says, The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. Think of it. Proverbs 16, 17 says, The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. Depart from evil. Choose the good. Refuse the evil. Choose life. Refuse death. Reject death. Follow after God, not the things that are contrary to God. Separate from the world. Separate to the things of God. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. Get away from it. Don't want it around me. Don't want my eyes dwelling on it. The things of this world, saturated with the enemy's influence. The enemy of your soul has influenced every philosophy, every religion, every sports game, every entertainment. Everything that's going on is saturated with the enemy's presence, philosophy, and religion. To keep us what? From the truth to keep us from the holy life, to keep us from the presence and the power of God. I'm not talking about locking yourself away in the bedroom and waiting for life to pass by, because Jesus himself said, or the Bible says that we're in the world, but not of the world. We're not a product of it. We don't seek after it. It says that we don't want the lust of this world. The, if, we, if we lust for the things of the world, it says what? That the fa- love of the Father is not in us. It's having this constant mindset that you are seated with Christ in heaven. Colossians says that we're seated with Christ in heaven. It says that if you have been raised with Christ, that we walk in him. That if we're raised with Christ, then it says, let this mindset be in you. That you are seated with Christ at the right hand of God the Father. That you're there now. That you live as a citizen of heaven, is what Philippians says. Recognizing that you are in Christ and that this old life is crucified. 
It doesn't mean that you can't go to the lake. It doesn't mean you can't go bowling. It doesn't mean you can't go someplace and do something and work and plant or build. It doesn't mean that you're not working for the... It means that you are operating with a mindset that is no longer just human. It's now the holy mindset of Christ Jesus. It's no longer just your own heart and value system and traditions of family. It's no longer in that realm of decadence and disobedience and defiance. It's now saturated with the presence of Christ in all things. That God Almighty is in my life, and I'm led by the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is in me, leading and guiding. But if we turn in indifference, if we turn no attention towards, if we put no weight on it and choose our own ways, if we say no to the things of God and want it this way, that way, I want to enjoy this, I want to enjoy my life. Gee, can I enjoy my life? And all of a sudden you realize that you now get that worldly mindset, that human nature, Adamic nature mindset, that flesh nature that starts leading you down that callous road. And you and I start realizing that God Almighty starts slipping from our mind. And the mind of Christ all of a sudden is no longer captivating our lives, but the mind of man. And we become man pleasers. And we start following after devil's influence and devil's suggestions and devilish thoughts and the chaotic mindsets. And you can't longer discern between good and evil, right and wrong, black and white, because we're starting to choose our own way. There's only one answer. It's to fall upon our knees in all humility and say, Lord of glory, would you come into my life? Forgive me for going wayward and for choosing my own way. Would you come into my life and let your love permeate every aspect of my being? Let my mind come alive with the things of God. Let my, my eyes open to the things of God. And let me submit fully and completely to the word of God in all things. You realize that what you and I called fun in this world was actually swimming through a cesspool. Hear me now when I'm all serious. That what people are calling fun in this world and enjoying this, that, and everything, filled with decadence, filled with the decaying of, of life, and all the things that we give ourselves to, I tell you today, it's like swimming through the cesspool. Instead of the fresh, clean water of the living water of Christ. That's why we constantly need to come together under the canopy of His Holy Spirit and say, Lord, would you cleanse me? Every time you and I walk through this world, your feet are picking up all the things of the dust of this world, the dust and the, de and the decay. It's my understanding, and I'm not known as a house cleaner, but it's my understanding that the majority of dust in our home is dead cells off our own skin. It gives you an idea of where we're at. That much of, the, much of the, what goes on in your own home that gives allergies and plagues is the refuse that comes from the insects that are in and about. Gives you an idea of where we're at. Did anybody ever show you that telescopic, microscopic type of technology that shows the things that are living on your body? I tell you, you'd be showering more than once a day <laughs> with lye. You start recognizing and realizing, you know, what we call beautiful is not really beautiful. What we call lovely is not lovely. You and I have not seen beautiful and lovely till we see him. Until you see what he's put inside of you, you have not seen beauty and lovely yet. You and I can look upon this cursed world and see all of the destruction and decay. And you see the mountains and you see the caverns and you see the deep crevices and the rocks. And we look and say, man, that's beautiful. And that's what's under a curse. That's what's been destroyed by the flood. Wait till you see what God has planned for a new heaven and a new earth. I tell you, it's nothing. Nothing can't even compare compared. Paul himself said that the sufferings that you are currently enduring cannot be compared to the glory. Never mind this world and the things that God made that we currently see under, wait till you see what he really has planned. But the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. If we run after evil, run after defiance, run after decadence, run after disobedience, run after worldliness, go after it, give ourselves to it, then we're giving up the things of God. We have that Esau mentality, and the Bible called them profane. The Bible calls Esau profane. Whatever you give yourself to, whatever I give myself to, that's what I really love. Wherever I'm spending my time, energies, and thoughts, whatever I want in my life, and whatever I'm going after, that's what you and I want. 
doesn't matter where you're at right now and through the day, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You could be working, building, pounding nails, building something, planting, driving. You're a deliverer. You're dealing with truck parts, car parts. You could be retired. You could be a mom. doesn't matter what you're doing. Do it all unto the glory of God. Do everything with the mindset that you belong to him. Let no cursed thing come out of your mouth. Let no plaguing thought come in that steals away that what God has for you. But instead we recognize that as it was in the days of Lot. That's what he says. Lot heard the word, destruction is coming. Flee from all that you know. Flee from this city. Flee from the lush grounds. Flee from your wealth, from your cattle, from your goats, from all the things that you have. Flee your own family. Flee your friends. Flee your area. Flee, flee the bazaar and the streets and the, and the lush fields that were around you and all the things that you chose earlier. Flee from it. Get away from it. Destruction is coming. He believed God. He believed God's word. He could have easily have said, no, no, no. The son-in-law did. The son-in-laws that were there said, nah, that's, that's not going to happen. Nah. I'm sure it's not going to happen. All things as, as they were. We keep going, we're buying, we're selling. You're telling me that fire is coming out of heaven. You're telling me that fire and brimstone, whatever that is, sulfuric fire is coming out of, falling out of the sky and going to destroy everything. God would never do that. God's not going to destroy this and that. And how many times I've seen people say, God would never do this. God would never do that. That can't be God. I don't want to serve a God who does that. And they put more weight on their own value system than his. And why do they think that way? So they can keep doing what they want and not yield to the Holy One of Israel. And realize that Jesus himself said twice, destruction is coming. When he himself said, destroyed them all. Everyone, everything. Fire and brimstone did fall out. It's made of fun of over the years. Fire from the sky, fire and brimstone. Oh, he preaches fire and brimstone. Doomsayer, why bother listening to him? Let's go to this church. Let's listen to this blessing and let's listen to that. I was reading in Isaiah this morning and it says that they raise up seers and they raise up prophets and they tell them to not talk to them about the truth. Tell me lies and tell me instead that everything's going to go well. And they raise up people to speak into their lives and to see for them and to say to them, this is what we want to hear. And they raise them up and they put them behind a pulpit. And they say, speak this to me instead. Speak lies to me. Speak blessing to me. Just tell me everything's good and everything's going great and everything's fine and all will be as it is. And the Lord said, I'm not with them. That's not my word. Destruction is coming. When Jeremiah was preaching, submit to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, that event actually happened. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar, Saddam Hussein himself said that he was the new Babylon, the new Nebuchadnezzar, and he was going to raise up Babylon. Look what happened to him. The truthfulness of it is he himself from Iraq in Babylon looked back over his own history and said, I'm going to raise up and be that new Babylon. He even started building an entire empire that looked like, and even found the very ruins of the Babylonian city and started building upon them to build it up. And Jeremiah was telling the people, submit to Nebuchadnezzar, it's of God. Submit, we're going into captivity for all of the evil that we've done. Surrender, submit, put yourself. God kept calling, and they instead said, no, we want to listen to our prophets. And the prophets then said, well, no, we have the temple. God won't do anything. No, we, we're Jerusalem. God's not going to do anything here. And God, through Jeremiah, said, I'm going to fight against you. You can't hide behind the walls and the temple. Guess what? Ezekiel revealed, I'm not in it. And they kept looking and saying, and listen to this prophet, and listen to that one, and say, no, we want to listen to Hananiah, and we want to see, they want to hear that everything's going to go fine. They're at the walls, they're about to breach it. No, it's not going to happen. God's for us. He loves us. And instead it was what? They came in and they destroyed them all. Not one stone was left on top of another. The temple was raped. 
torn asunder, taken down. The vessels were pulled out and brought to, Cal brought to the Chaldeans in Babylon. And Jeremiah kept calling out to them, repent, repent, turn, turn, submit, surrender to God's will, surrender to the Holy One of Israel. This is the seriousness of it all. Example after example after example is in this Bible, and Jesus himself gave two of them. There are three stories in the Bible that are the most debated and the most disputed and the most defied in the Bible by the heretics, by the atheists, and by the doubters and the skeptics, the, cyn the cynical. One is, is Noah's Ark, the flood. Jesus referenced it himself. The other event that is the most doubted, most disputed, most defied, that's held by the skeptics and saying this can't be, cannot be, it's, it's too, it's too far-fetched, this possibly couldn't have happened. It's just a story, just illustration, was Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction. Jesus himself referenced it. And the third one was Jonah's whale. He said, nah, how can that happen? That couldn't have happened. And Jesus referenced that one as well and referenced himself as one in the whale. The very three stories that are the most disputed in the Bible are the very three that Jesus himself pinpointed and, and, and pointed towards. And here, two of them, back to back, this is the seriousness of it. That people are giving themselves today. Look at your own neighbors. Look at your own towns. Look at your own cities. Look at the schools. Look at the way business practices are. Look what's going on where people are spending the money. Look at the amusement parks. Look at what's going on in third world countries. Look at the pagan things that are going on. Look at the spirituality. Look at the drug problem, the promiscuity problem. Look at the family breakdown. Look what's going on in China and all these third world countries. Look what's going on in the closets. Look what's going on in the back rooms of urban developments. Look at the crime, look at the fury, look at the kids, look at the gangs. We got problems because Christ is slowly but surely being rejected, denied. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want Christ in my life. I don't want holy life. I want my life. I don't want holy life. I want my life. I want to call the shots and do whatever I want. And this body is calling to eat, drink, and be merry. This body is calling to be loved, to be cared for, to be comforted. This thing is calling for pleasure. This thing is calling for, and whatever it wants, I'm going to give it. I don't want this holy life. I want my life. And no one's going to take it from me. I'm not listening to dad, mom, and I'm certainly not going to listen to that fool sitting behind this pulpit. But I'm telling you the truth. And you and I need to be tellers of the truth. It's coming. You and I need to be tellers of the truth. We can sit there in pride. We can sit there and ignore it. We can sit there and say, well, that was a little strong. We can do all kinds of things to try to deflect the truthfulness of it. But the truthfulness of it, it's for you and I. This isn't for you. This isn't for me. This is for us. The truthfulness of it needs to captivate our minds and who we are. To realize that people are dying everywhere. I went by just Still Oaks the other day and they were having a funeral. And I'm going by it and I'm realizing, I'm thinking about, you know, right there, there's a coffin in there. Somebody's having a funeral for somebody. There's family crying in there. There's families hurt over there. You can just drive by and say, oh, yeah, another one's dead. Put him in the cemetery. Put him in the box. Put him on the ground. Move on with life. Or you can realize there's another soul right there. And there's people all around that consoling one another, remembering when, looking at pictures, looking at medallions that they made, putting gifts and kids coming over and putting things in the box. And, and you can try to make it sound very religious. And you can, but does that person know Christ Jesus? That's what it comes down to. Because as far as that person's concerned, whoever it was on that day, just last week, and how many funerals throughout all the earth that this is what's going on. For that person... The days of the Son of Man just came upon them. For once to die, then the judgment. So what is the importance of baptism on August when we have baptism? Boy, is it important. Boy, is it important to know Christ. Boy, is it important to be immersed into his presence, his character. We can ignore it right now. I'm tired. It's late. I'm hungry. Gee, I wish I was at the races. Boy, I could be at the Red Sox game. Boy, it'd be nice to be at the lake. 
could go to a barbecue today. Boy, would that be great. Boy, I should have done something else this morning. You know, I go to church 52 times a year. I mean, I'm 51. I can't do 51. We can do all kinds of things to try to make it palatable to ourselves. But the truthfulness of it is, you better be a pursuer of God. The truthfulness of it is that we had better be people pursuing after God. The Bible says pursue love. That's what it says. If we don't, then we're in direct defiance against his command. Purify our souls, we just sang. Lord, purify my soul. Help me, Jesus. Anybody coming into this church, coming as a new visitor, God's going to call to the north, the south, the east, and the west and call people to come here. We had better be people that are going to help them to grow in the knowledge of God. Not just be thankful, gee, our church is growing. Gee, we're going to have to expand our walls. We have more people coming. If they're coming, they better be growing. Amen? Amen. If they're coming, they better be deepening in the things of God. There's devils all around destroying lives. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be driving people to their knees to call upon the Holy One of Israel. God, would you do something in their life? Our nation needs, our world needs, people need, souls need Christ. God, help us. I tell you today, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. What is evil? Just read the Bible and you'll start realizing that anything that is not, a, that is not of faith is sin. Boy, that covers a lot. Whatever is not of faith is sin. That's what he says. Without holiness, no one will see God. That's scary. Work out, your, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That should scare us right there. The seriousness of it is that they destroyed them all. And Lord, I don't want to be in the lot of all of them that are, that are destroyed. I want to be in the lot that escaped the wrath of God. To deliver our own souls from the destruction that's coming. To declare it to everyone, Lord, would you do a work in their life? My prayer even right now is, Lord, that the seriousness of it would weigh into our souls. That the heaviness of it would come into our souls and realize that the devil has been having a heyday into people's lives. And I've seen families where the devil is so well entrenched in their family, it's hard for them to see clearly. It's hard for them to get out of it and think clearly. They're so entrenched in devils speaking all kinds of things in their lives. They're so wrapped up in, 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 in devilish, uh, 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 like leeches around them, just sucking the life out of them. Lord, deliver them in Jesus' name. To see young gals and young men running around like young bulls out there doing all kinds of things, like, like dogs in the street. I get so bothered. I say, Lord, let pur purity and holiness come into their lives. We've got pastors and churches all through the United States right now even, all through the world on a Sunday morning, preaching all kinds of things that walk, make us feel good about ourselves rather than realizing that we are got to call upon the things of God. It's not about being entertained and putting on film clips from movies and secular movies and being entertained and feeling moved and, oh, that was wonderful. Oh, I was so moved. I was so moved. That's so wonderful. And then go live like the devil and like the world and do everything else's. Then it didn't move you to nothing. We must be moved to move to our knees and say, Lord, like Isaiah when he saw the Lord, I'm cut off. Lord, help me. To come to that realization that we're not looking to move your emotions. We're not looking to move your feelings. We're looking to move you to call upon the things of God. That's what this church is about. It's about the humility of God, about the power of God, about deliverance of God, about calling upon the things of God and to make us into a church of holiness, a church of love, a church of the Holy Spirit. And when the Lord increases us, Lord, that he would give us depth in Jesus' name. There's too much junk going on, too much stuff, too much fat, and not enough meat. I mean, how would you like to go? I know a lot of people like going to Johnson's restaurant. How would you like to get, like, steak tips? I know it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> steak tips delivered. A roast beef. Get a nice ribeye. Delivered. And they bring it out nice and hot, right on the plate. She goes, here you go. And it's just saturated with fat. Just a few slivers of meat. Every so often, here and there. Look, I say, I paid 18 bucks for that. $18. <laughs> for that? I'm not going to buy that. I want the, give me some meat on this. I don't mind a little fat, but this is ridiculous. And yet every Sunday morning, pulpits everywhere are delivering that same meal. 
fat, making us fat, and not hearing the things of God. We need meat. I want the holiness, the humility, the love of God, calling for decisions. Stop being cowards. Let us be a church. America church, rise up. Awake. Awake in Jesus' name. Come to the revival that God has for you, a revival of consecration. I'm just tired of the fat coming around that is, that is all just crisp and barbecued and munching on it and calling it good and nutritious when it's nothing for us. We need the pure protein of God's word, the meat that comes into our lives. Lord, that's what we want in Jesus' name. I don't want to be Capernaum. Capernaum, assembly of God. Where we come in and we watch all that God is doing and walk out the same way and never follow him. I don't want to be Sodom assembly. Definitely not. And yet, and I know how this sounds, but that's what's going on in many churches even today. Many of the very religious denominations today that were once the revival of America are today could be called Sodom. Sodom church, Sodom community church. Because they're allowing and permitting that which exactly what was done that was called evil and permitting it. Being excused. I want the highway of upright church. Highway of the upright. Not in arrogance, not in high mindedness, not in the nose lifted up. Oh, you're not quite ready. You haven't measured up. Don't you know who I am? I'm an usher. Usher. I've got this position appointed here, anointed. Mm -hmm. Me. Pen. Paper. So much foolishness on such foolish stuff. And sadly to say, I've gone into many churches. That's exactly what we're doing. I'm not here today, and I know you know my heart. I'm not here today to slam churches. I'm here to slam all the stuff that's going on. This isn't a matter of tear them down so that we look good. I'm telling you, this is what's really going on. And you wonder why we're, our country is the way it is, because the church isn't doing what the church is supposed to be doing. This is our fault. This is our fault. This is the church's fault. This isn't pointing to the president. This isn't pointing to the governor. This isn't pointing to the selectmen. This isn't pointing to all those bad people and all the drug dealers and all the rapists and all the crime going on in the prisons. This is the church's fault. Because the church didn't preach the word. And the church people sitting in pews aren't going out and doing, they're instead holding themselves in high regard and treating everybody else with condemnation. Rather than realizing that unless the grace of God, that's exactly where I would be. I know that's where I'd be. Instead of preach the word, trying to build malls for churches and CEOs as pastors and building businesses and business practices rather than realizing that we need the truthfulness of God's word going forth, not from this mouth, but from every mouth. With the pure heartbeat of God, with the pure humility that is in Christ, not just from this mouth, but every mouth. Calling upon, saying, come to Christ. Come to Jesus. Read your Bible. What can I do for you today? Do you not know that when I pray, God hears? Pray for people. That you know that when you pray for someone, that God hears what you're praying and pray for people. And be bold to stand up against those devils. What happened Monday night prayer is that a group of people got together and prayed for a young man named Jedediah. I was telling this, you know, three years ago, I'd have been doing that work and everybody else would have been watching. Saying, gee, you know, what, what's going on? Learning, trying to grow, trying to figure out what, and, and praying, but not. But this time, everybody's involved. People are praying, calling upon, interceding, praising the Lord, standing up, speaking words, praying for, all being done in unity. That's a power. That's something happening. God is at work in our lives. We need to see breakthrough in people's lives, one at a time, one at a time. So all of a sudden, God says, enough with the one at a time, ten at a time, hundred at a time, thousand at a time. But if we're not faithful with the one, we can't be faithful for the thousand. The Lord's been teaching this church what it is to be the church. Please hear me now. The Lord has been teaching this church what it is to truly be the church. Church is not something you attend. 
Church is something that you strategize and conduct warfare against principalities and powers. Church is calling for decision. Church is rebuking devils and standing in the faith, saying, thus far, no father. That's it. You're done. Boom. Christ is in town. It's planting a flag up on the hill, calling it and putting the word of God on it and saying, our land belongs to the Holy One of Israel. It's about people going into Pittsfield, Epsom, Northwood, wherever you live, and saying, my house is his house. And that all neighbors come to know, yeah, you're one of them. Not in arrogance, not in assertiveness, not in foolishness, not in superstition, but in simple love of God, walking in the holiness of the upright. I'm on the highway of holiness in Jesus' name. That all of a sudden when we start seeing the one breakthrough, the one breakthrough, the one breakthrough, the one, and all of a sudden we get trained and we start realizing that's what he's all about. That's what God is doing. That's the character of God. This is how you conduct warfare. All of a sudden, 10 come and break through. And we all know what's going on, and that one's helping this one, and two are helping that one. And then all of a sudden, you find that the tens upon tens can be helped. And then you see the hundred being helped. Then you see the thousand being helped. It can happen in a fortnight. It can happen in a moment. God Almighty can move upon us at any time. But should he keep us small, let us be powerful. But when he brings increase, let us find ourselves to be more powerful. Let us find the depth that is in his holiness, the depth that is in his love, and let the peace and the joy rule our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.